<laughs> I was just checking something. Hello, fly tires. How are you today? We're going to tie a, oh God, I forgot the name of this fly. It's so long. I got to look it up here. The beadhead emerging sparkle caddis pupa. God, what a name, huh? That's a long name. Um, anyway, so uh, we're going to tie this fly today. And it's a good one. Um, it's, uh, I find it to be a really good fly uh, whenever caddis flies are hatching. Um, you know, whether, whether fish are rising or not rising, or you don't see any fish at all, if there are um, caddis flies on the water, you know the fish are going to be eating those pupas, pupae, pupas, whatever is correct, uh, underneath water. Uh, they they kind of dribble. Usually caddis dribble off all day long. So the fish are looking for them. You know, they're, they're seeing them. Uh, they're looking for that sparkle in the water because they get a, uh, they get a, a bubble of gas inside the pupil case, which rises them to the surface where they can emerge. But the fish pick them off quite deep. Um, cl close to the bottom. I did a, I did a podcast uh, last week, or the week before, the week before, um, on caddis flies with Emmy Sorcy, um, who is an expert on uh, entomology. She's, she's also the uh, manager of our Jackson Hole store. And we talked about caddis flies. So if you're interested in learning more about caddis flies, how to fish them, um, you may want to go and listen to that podcast. But this fly works. This fly works quite well. I'll show you how well it works. Actually, I'm going to do a little bragging here. Um, so yesterday morning, I went out mid-morning. Uh, not a not a great time of year to to go fishing. Usually, it's it's late afternoon or evening. Uh, but I I had some time. It was a nice day. I went out and I fished this fly. Um, and See if we can get that to focus. And that's the fish that ate this fly. <laughs> it was the only fish I caught. I hooked another one. The only fish I caught. But um, it was a, you know, don't think I catch fish like that every time I go out. This was probably my, my uh, big fish of the season. But, you know, it was an oddball time. Um, nothing rising. Not really many caddis flies in the on the water, on the air, but I didn't see a few. So I figured, well, I'll try this caddis pupa that I'm tying tomorrow. And so it worked. Um, so that's the fly we're going to tie. And it'll work for you if you have any, any uh, caddis flies around. So why don't we start? And um, Julia's not here today. She's still on maternity. Phil's not here. Phil is uh, up in Maine fishing at, uh, at uh, Cooper's, and so um, Cooper's, is it? Libby Camps, sorry, Libby Camps. Um, Phil is up fishing at Libby Camps in Maine. Um, so we have Tanner producing the show today. Say hi, Tanner. Hi, Tanner. <laughs> and and uh, Tanner will be reading off your questions to me and running the... Um, Running the poll for the winner. You think I'll win today, Tanner? There'll be a vote at the end. You Tom sure about that? Tim. <laughs> no. No, I'm all alone today. I'm all alone. Okay. So anyway, um, let's start this. It's not a it's not a terribly difficult fly, and it's not terribly easy, uh, but it's not bad. It's kind of an intermediate level, level nymph. So anyway. Um, I'm going to start and I'm going to use, I like this check nymph hook on, on this, um, on this pattern. It has a big wide eye so that the bead doesn't slip over the eye. If you put a, a little bit bigger bead on it and it has a nice, uh, it has a short shank, but it has a nice curve in it. So if you want to tie the fly with a little curve in it, you can do that. Uh, it's barbless, very sharp. Um, I landed that big fish on on this hook uh, yesterday, and I I had no right to land that fish. I mean, I was all alone. That fish went between my legs. Um, he he kept running back out to the center of the river, 
And I swiped them a couple times with a net and missed, which you never swipe at a fish with a net, but I was all by myself and it was a real cluster. Um, but the hook stayed in. So barbless hooks work. So anyway, let's take one of these hooks out of the package here. And I'm tying on a size 16, as you can see. You could tie this in size 12 through 18, I think. Uh, 16's a good, lot, a lot of caddis are about a size 16, 18. So this is a good, this is a good size uh, to tie a caddis imitation. In. There's a finished one that will dump out of the vise. And, oh, first of all, before I do that, I got to put a bead on there. I got to put a bead on there, and I'm going to use, for this, I'm going to use a, a 332nd uh, gold tungsten bead. So these beads have a, a big hole and a little hole, and you want to put the hook through the little hole, and sometimes you have to roll them around in your finger to see which side is which. And sometimes and it's a little bit difficult with these curved in hooks because um, they, it's a little bit difficult to thread the bead. But I managed to get it on there. And there is the hook in the vise. Now I'm going to take a little bit of non-toxic wire. I think this is 20 thousandths. And I would prefer 15, but I didn't have any 15. So it's a little thicker, a little thicker than, than I really wanted to use. But um, we'll make it work. And a couple, couple of reasons for the wire. One is to add a little bit extra weight to the fly so we can get it down. And the other reason is to hold the bead in place. So I'm going to just start kind of in the middle and wrap forward and break it off and break it off there. Now, uh, when you put waiting wire on here, it's always going to compress. So don't worry if you start it too far back. I got a little nub there. I'll just shove up inside the, so you shove it forward with your fingernail. And now you got uh, plenty of room to work. Now I'm going to start my thread. I'm using 60 or 12 all black. You could use you could use 80 on this. Uh, I'm going to start my thread behind the wire, and I'm going to build up a little bump, and then I'm going to just crisscross back a few times over that wire just to keep it in place, and then come back to right around the last turn of waiting. And then I'm going to switch glasses here. Then I'm going to take some Antron, Antron yarn, and I'm using brown. I'm using kind of a rusty brown for the shuck and a, a dark brown for the body. You can make these any color you want. Uh, I happened to, I was doing some seining on the river the other day that I fish a lot, and I happened to notice that there were a lot of uh, fairly dark brown caddis pupae. So I'm just trying to imitate what I saw. I have no idea what the species was. I'm going to cut off a piece, and I typically find that just one card, one card length, so I just pull it from here to there. And that's what you want to use. And then sometimes this Antron yarn has knots in it. And I'm going to zoom in a little bit here. And you want this to, you want this to be a little on the fuzzy side. So I like to take a finger brush or a comb or whatever you have and just brush it out because sometimes there's knots in the middle of that and I don't want it to stick together. I want it to separate. So I just take it like that and fuzz it up a little bit. 
And then I'm going to take the yarn and I'm going to fold it over my thread in half, like so. And then I'm going to start right where that weight ended. I can get it in there. Oh, sometimes it slips. Ah, having trouble today. There we go. And come down just a little bit down the bend. Caddis pupae are not that terribly curved. They're relatively straight in posture when they're drifting. You see a lot of them kind of curved, but um, see a lot of imitations kind of curved, but the, the fly itself is pretty straight when you look at them underwater. Oh, and by the way, uh, I use one strand of this uh, Antron for a 16 or an 18, and then I use one and a half to two strands for a 14, uh, one and a half for a 14 and two strands for a 12. So you get enough of it. So just you're gauging how much to use uh, depending on the hook size you have. Then I'm going to uh, make a rib from, I like this, I like this hot yellow um, ultra wire and it's in size brassy only because uh, the pupae I saw had, uh, had kind of a yellowish rib. And, and caddis pupae are, are quite distinctly ribbed. So I think a rib is important in this. But I think any anything that kind of contrasts with the body color and sparkles a little bit will work. And then I'm going to tie the wire. You can shove it up into the bead if you want. I'm going to tie it or not. I'm going to tie the wire onto the shank. Didn't quite go into bead, but that's okay. We're gonna cover all that stuff up. Then I'm gonna come back to the beginning where I started and get some dubbing. You can use any old dubbing you want for this body. It's gonna be covered up. Whatever dubbing you have handy um, in the right color. I happen to I happen to have a new box of this Bruiser Blend uh, dubbing that I that I quite like. It's nice and soft. It dubs easy. So I'm going to use a brown, a uh, bunch of brown Bruiser Blend. But again, a lot of time, a lot of caddis pupae are olive, bright green, gray, and I'm going to dub this. Let me switch cameras. Going to dub a little noodle. Onto the onto the hook of this bruiser blend. Then I'm going to wind it forward. And you can either take your fur all the way to the front, or you can, or you can just stop there. It doesn't really matter. Depends on how much working room you have, but I'm going to stop there. I don't like that little piece of tinsel sticking out of there. It comes with the, the stuff. And then, um, then you're going to wind your rib. Nice, closely spaced, tight ribs. Because again, these caddis pupae are quite segmented. in the way of the camera here. Take a couple turns. I'm going to helicopter this off. Take a couple more turns for security. And now, the hardest part of this fly, um, hopefully I won't get my fingers in the way. Got another piece of that tinsel sticking out that I don't like there. Um, first of all, I kind of messed this, messed this, uh, Antron up. 
I kind of just get it all going all over the place. Like so. Just kind of futz with it. And then you bring it forward over that over that uh, part where your tying thread is. And then either using a dubbing needle or your fingers, pull out a few strands, maybe a dozen, 10 strands of it to form the shuck. And then take a loose turn all the way around that spot. And then you look at it. And you turn it to make sure this, this is not that important to the fish, but you can take your dubbing needle. And if you got a spot that didn't get covered up, just kind of move that stuff around, shove it back a little bit. You don't want a big bubble. And this. some people tie their cat as pupae with a big bubble, but you don't need a big wide bubble. You just need something encasing that body. And then I also like to make sure I gather all these, twist them a little bit and cut it off. And that's your shuck hanging off the back of the fly. Now, once you got that bubble in place, take a couple of really good tight turns. And I mean tight. This is the first thing that falls apart on one of these is, is the shuck coming off. And then trim it off, but don't trim it off too short. Because you want to come back, you want to kind of come back and grab those ends, bind them under, but grab them a little bit more just so they stay in place. So there's your body. I see I got a, I, I don't see some of these things until I look at the camera. Okay, so now we're ready for our hackle. And I see I got a nubbin sticking up there too. You could build this head up pretty good. And I wouldn't worry, I wouldn't worry terribly about stuff like that that sticks up because it's going to be all covered up. I could trim it a little bit. Tanner, any questions so far? None so far. Wow. Okay. All right. Um, we're going to put a um, Hungarian partridge hackle on this. And I would advise you, I know they're expensive, but I would advise you that if you are going to use Hungarian partridge, get yourself a skin. Because if you buy just a bag of Hungarian partridge, um, you, you're, you're not going to get the size you want. And it's really annoying and you can't find the size that you need. So, you know, get yourself, get yourself a whole skin. They're about 50 bucks, but they'll last you a long time. And the other reason, and the reason I like these uh, skins from Orvis is that a lot of time you'll buy a skin and it doesn't have the wings. See the wing there? And the wings, all you get is this part here. The wings are actually the place where you're going to find the best small feathers. Let me just adjust that exposure a little bit here. There we go. So there's your We have a question wing. now, Tom. Yeah. Would you substitute EP fibers for the Antron yarn? You could. You could. There's a lot of people, myself included, that believe that Antron has some sort of magical properties underwater. Gary LaFontaine said it was trilobal and that it reflected light better. And you won't get the same effect with EP fiber. But um, if you don't have any Antron, then try it. See how it works. And what type of thread are you using? 
Orvis 12O Black. And would it be effective to tie this in red? Uh, oh. Adam says that they're in Canada and there's lots of smoke from forest fires and notice that they really like red right now. Yeah, try it. I never tried it in red, but yeah. Uh, by the way, we're, we're seeing your smoke from Alberta here in Vermont too. So thanks a lot. It's quite hazy. Okay, so is that it? Any more? No. Uh, any other colors work for the bubble? Yeah, tan, tan, dark brown. I'm not sure if the color of the bubble is that important. That's all for now. Okay. So anyway, I'm you if you come into the wing, you'll see that down at the bottom of it are some really small speckled feathers, which you don't see. They aren't as good on the cape. So what I do is it's hard to grab one so what i do is i carefully pluck a bunch of them it's hard to get out of there out of there and then um you know i may be tying a bunch of flies but also um i didn't get one quite big enough there um and the the other ones that you pull out that you're not going to use just put them in a little ziploc bag and then you can, here's the size I want. Um, here, I'll show you. So here's just an old Ziploc bag that some of my, some of my beads came from. And I just, I just put the rest of the feathers I'm not going to use in that because it is easier to pluck a bunch of them at one time. And then um, you're going to want to strip, you're going to want to strip the fuzz from the bottom of this and you need a little bit of a stem to wind it. And there's your feather. And then you wanna hold it by the very tip and stroke these fibers back. So you get two little wings, it's still too bright. Two little wings and a tip. And you can even Come in and try to get a few more fibers out of there, like so. You could substitute a, a modeled hen feather um, for this if you can find them small enough. But not a hen saddle. You won't be able to find them small enough to tie these things. Okay, so I'm going to take that little triangle there and I'm going to bind that in about four really tight turns. Maybe five, because I don't want that to pull out when I'm winding it. Snip it. And then this is a tricky part because these feathers are so delicate and the stem is short. But you grab it by the tip with your hackle pliers and fold this back. So it's all streaming back and then you wind it. You may have to twist the feather a little bit in order to get it to lay in there. And you're only going to get about one turn, which is perfect. You don't want a lot of hackle in this. You just want the impression of some legs streaming out from behind this thing. I'm going to take a couple turns. Oh, that's coming out good. I should have tied this against Flagler today. Stroke those back. Take a few more turns for security. Wind back a little bit on that hackle so that it just kind of distributes itself all around the fly. And finally, we're gonna we're gonna make a head out of peacock curl. And another reason, another reason to get a full peacock eye and not buy your peacock curl in, in what they call strung peacock curl or, you know, a bunch of peacock curl in a bag because you get different sizes of peacock curl. The stuff down here at the base is very thin 
and fine. And as you get up here towards the eye, it's much bigger and fluffier. So for this, to get, give this thing a nice, neat little head, I like to come down here at the bottom of the eye. And again, you're not going to get this choice of sizes when you buy a, just a bag of peacock curl. And I'm going to take those two strands. Oh, always, always cut the very ends off your peacock curl because it's very fragile there. Let's cut them off. Always, always. And then you take these peacock curls, shiny side out, and lash them to the hook. You got a little hangover there. You can trim it off. And then uh, just wind this forward about two or three turns. And that's plenty there. Eh, maybe I'll go one more turn. And then you want to tie that off right up against the bead. A little tough getting in here with the camera. Trim it off. Take a couple, stroke that peacock curl back a little bit. Take a couple more turns just to make sure you got it secured in there. Oh, I didn't get it secured, but I can fix that. It's going to grab that strand that got away from me. Maybe a couple more. There we go. And oh, I forgot my whip finisher. Gonna go over to my desk. And whip finish. And a little drop of head cement right behind the bead. And you're done. And that's the way it looks. And it does work. I can attest to that. Uh, you can swing this fly because somebody's going to ask, how do you fish it? Uh, I find that dead drift works best. I hardly ever pick up fish um, on the swing with this fly, with, with beadhead flies in general. I just don't. Once the once the indicator or the the line the leaders start to to drag or swing, it's all over. And I feel like you should pick it up and go forward. So that is the um, whatever that long name is. Sparkle beadhead, uh, beadhead sparkle caddis pupa, whatever. Um, I can never remember the name. It's way too long. We got to shorten the name of that fly. It's way too long. What the hell is the name of that fly? Beadhead emerging sparkle caddis pupa. Okay. There you go. The, there's two other questions, Tom. Uh, would yeah. you tie this in a light olive? Absolutely. I would. I would uh, either either look in the water if if you know if you're if you're in a place for a couple of days, you have tying materials, or you fish the same the same river a lot um take a uh, paint strainer take a dollar 95 paint strainer and stretch it over your orvis uh wide wide bodied net it fits perfectly a five gallon paint strainer fits perfectly it's the best insect stream strainer i've ever used and hold it in the water and wait until you get some uh, some drifting insects in there and then pick it up and look at and look and see what's drifting in there. The other option is to, uh, you know, just do some research on a river you're going to fish and find out 
what color the caddis pupae are. I'm not sure if the color is that super important anyway. I think it's more the profile, uh, the shape of the thing and the sparkle and where you fish it. Um, but, you know, we try to imitate the color as best we can. Uh, speaking of where would you fish this in a small stream? Yeah, I'd fish it anywhere. I generally fish it in bigger rivers for bigger fish. Um, you know, in, in small streams, I generally use more generic prince nibs and hares ears and pheasant tails. But this would work very well in a small stream, yeah. And how about your hackle pliers? Where'd you get uh, these hackle pliers are from... Oh, I forgot the name of them. Uh, they're from hair. I got them from hairline. Uh, maybe somebody, I, I can't remember the name of them. Come on, focus. Anyway, uh, Cotterelli, Cotterelli. That's it. They're, they're Italian. And they're very nice. They're adjustable. They're not cheap, but they're worth it. Is this fly exclusively for trout or will it catch other species? Well, it's a little small for bass. I mean, a bass might eat it, but um, steelhead will take this fly for sure. Probably Atlantic salmon would at one point or another. Um, you know, especially landlocked Atlantic salmon. It's mainly a trout fly. Uh, panfish will eat it because they eat a lot of small insects and crustaceans. So panfish will eat it. It's mainly a trout fly. That's all the questions for right now. All right. Well, thank you, everyone, for, um, for tuning in today. Um, our next tying session is going to be on June, let me look it up here. I'm not, there's not going to be one next Monday because it's Memorial Day. The next one is going to be on June 8th, and that's a Thursday. It's a tie-off with Tim Flagler, and we don't know what pattern we're tying yet. We haven't, we haven't, I haven't decided because it's my turn to pick. And I'm certainly not going to pick that stupid anything with quill wings whew, like we did last time. Um, so anyway, um, that's the next, that's the next tying session. And I'm going to be on vacation. I don't know. How, I don't know how many sessions we're going to have in June because I'm going to be on vacation for a couple of weeks. And, um, and then I have a video shoot. So we may, may be only one tying session in June, but it'll be a tie off. And I know you all love, I know you all love the tie offs. Anyway, um, if there are no further questions, I'll, I'll wait for a minute if there's any other questions, and then we'll, uh, we'll have class dismissed. Try this fly. It works. It works very well. If you don't know what fly to put on, you don't see anything going on, this time of year especially, this is a good one because there's lots of caddis hatching and they're always in the water column. War Dog 7621 says, I win. Yay, I won. Any suggestions for fishing in smoky conditions? No. I don't think I don't think the smoke bothers the fish much. Um, might cut down on your sunlight a little bit, which might be good for fishing, but um, I, I don't have any, I've fished in smoky conditions quite often and I never noticed that much of a difference other than it's not as, not as uh, nice to take pictures. Other than that, fishing seems to be okay. All right, everyone. Thank you for tuning in. It really means a lot to us that, that, that you all come in and, and, um, and watch and hopefully tie along and, um, We'll see you in early June for the tie-off. Thanks.